Welcome to Mother Miriam Live on the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network with live video streaming brought to you by LifeSite News and the Station of the Cross. Call Mother with your questions at 1-877-511-5483 or email her at mother at thestationofthecross.com. You can view the live stream on Facebook at Mother Miriam Live. Now, here's Mother Miriam. Good morning, beloved family. How are you doing? I pray that you are well every day. I pray that you are well every single day. We pray for all of you who listen, and and especially those who call and write and text with all their intentions. We pray for you all the time. Uh, Well, every day we take you into our rosary, and we returned last night from Sunday's Um, rosary rally, the coast to coast and actually country to country rosary rally in Washington, D.C., right in front of the White House. Um, Well, a few feet away at least, but you could see the White House behind us for those of you who were able to tune in uh, live stream. And we pray the rosary and um, I learned that 65, 65, 65 countries, 57,000 people in 65 countries joined in with us and were especially um, synced at the um, 4 p.m. Eastern hour, which is 3 p.m. Tulsa time and 1, 1 p.m. on the uh, West Coast. And we all at that moment began the glorious mysteries of the rosary and it was a wonderful 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 time um and we have so many people to thank for it but especially the warrior in these days putting all these things together is father rick heilman who uh, is pastor of saint mary's in pine bluff and has done so many things and um pine bluff wisconsin Um, It was a truly, the people who were there, I don't know how many people were physically there. Many had flown in for it. It was a nice-sized crowd, and just as it actually began, it started raining, and I thought, this is terrific. This is really like, it was October 13th, the anniversary of Our Lady of Fatima, and it was just like Fatima. It was raining. Uh Only... uh, we didn't have too many umbrellas, but a very kind angel gentleman came up and, and put his umbrella over me. Um, and it was uh, really beautiful. So after the rain, I kept looking I kept looking for the sun to come out and spin a little bit in Washington, D.C., but that didn't happen. It did clear up later, but it was beautiful. And um, many of you, uh, I think, joined uh, on... Um, live stream or or just pray in groups where you live um and truly truly those who are involved in the in in the rosary coast to coast truly truly wonderful and our lady has done miraculous things through that rosary and she's asked us to pray it every single day and you know i I am greatly comforted by the fact that St. Therese of Lisieux did not like to pray the rosary because it's not that I don't like to pray it, but, you know, I never feel like praying it. How do I, I'll tell you, I'm I'm admitting that to you. Um, I just don't. And um, there are, you know, the more you do it, the more habitual, of course, we pray it every day. Um, The more habitual it comes and the more you can really begin to pray the mysteries and and forget you're praying the rosary and the Hail Marys just become background to the meditation. It actually happens. I'm I'm, I'm a test case. It actually happens. And so what is the motive to pray the rosary? There's only one. There's only one. Our Lady, the Mother of the Messiah, the Mother of our Savior, has asked us to pray it every day. That's the reason. She didn't ask us to feel good about it. She didn't even tell us it was our devotion. He, I don't think she even used the words devotion, because when we think of devotion, we think of being all inspired and filled with the Holy Spirit, and that doesn't have to be the case. We just need to pray it, you know? You tell your children, go do your homework, but I don't want to, Mommy, I don't want to. She, I know you don't want to. Go do it. Well, I'll do it later. No, you won't. You'll do it now, you know? And the child doesn't feel like it. But once 
you know, the son or daughter gets into the homework, uh, they go with it. And it's the same with the rosary. If we're not really up to praying it, or we're not, it, it's not yet our our uh, beloved devotion. We just pray it. It's our homework, you know. It's the homework that Our Lady has given us. Nothing to do with feelings. It has to do with the salvation of souls all over the world. So. Um, it really was a glorious time, and from my heart, I thank all those who put it together. Truly, truly do. It's because of all these wonderful people that we have, these events uh, that keep us focused um, and that give us the speakers were uh, kept reminding us um, that this is our warfare. This is the weapon of our warfare. So um, we need to pray it. Take up your rosary and pray it. And we are in the middle of the uh, saint, uh, I'm calling him a saint already, Bishop Fulton Sheen, his cause is up for canonization, but he's not Saint Sheen yet. Uh, I think he will be, though. And he wrote a book in 1944 called The Mysteries of the Rosary, which, um, oh, now I, I'm forgetting your name again. It begins with an R. I have to look it up before the program. Um, sent to me, and it's wonderful. And so we are now up to, in the joyful mystery, in the sorrowful mystery, rather, the sorrowful mystery is the carrying of the cross. Um, oh, here I go again. I don't know where. I don't know where I... Oh, this is terrible. I didn't straighten all these papers out before the program. So the carrying of the cross... I am going to, well, Jesus said, take up your cross daily and follow me. Here it is. Crosses are of two kinds. Pure ones, which come from the outside, such as pain, persecution, and ridicule. And inner or impure crosses, which come as the result of our sins, such as sadness, despair, and unhappiness. Now, Bishop Sheen doesn't say this, beloved, but I'm going to break into this article to tell you that... Um, God, the devil, would want us to go into despair. And he would want us to have a self-pity party and for others to be sympathetic with us. But when someone's in despair, they don't need sympathy because despair is a mortal sin. That's why Judas went to hell. He despaired. When you despair, you lose hope. When you lose hope, you actually deny God. Because if you don't deny God, you know that nothing's impossible for him. He's on the throne, and he's going to take care of it. If you so lose God as to completely focus on you and your feelings and your situation, you are in danger of going to hell. I, I know. In, in our self-centered world, we say, what are you talking about? Come on, there are people who have lost family, who have, who have done every lost limbs, uh, every atrocity or they've been abused has happened to them. How could you not tell them it's a mortal sin to go into despair? I could tell them that because it is. Because we cannot, that's one way God rescues us. You know, when someone's drowning and we throw them a lifesaver and we're yelling at them and they're saying, I can't swim, help, I can't swim. And we're saying, take the lifesaver. No, I can't, I can't swim. They're so focused on themselves, they're going to drown and die. And so we throw them a lifesaver and, the, and we don't say, sweetheart, go ahead and take the life. We don't say that. We said, take the lifesaver, put your hand on it, you know, yell at them. And see, don't be so hard on them. They're in trouble. We have to be to save their life. And God does that with us. If we go into despair, we have lost God. And people say, no, I haven't, but I can't get out of this. No, you have. You have been swallowed up by your own misery. And you have lost God. Because to despair is to sink into a world without God. And at that point, you actually deny him. You actually deny him. And even if you say, I'm not denying him, you know, you're, and you're swimming, you say, I can't swim. And you say, well, you want to drown? If you don't want to drown, take the lifesaver. No, I don't want to drown. I don't want to drown, but I can't swim. You see, but they won't take the lifesaver. Same thing. If you go into despair, um, God is shouting at you. He's saying to you, if you let yourself sink that low, you're on your way to hell. 
you are on your way to hell unless you come out of it and go, you must go to confession. You must not receive communion. You must go to confession. Well, what kind of God do we have? A God that wants to save us, a God that loves us. And he says, if you despair, you've lost all hope. You've lost me. You've gone away from the lifesaver and you can't save yourself. You have to come to me. You have to grab the lifesaver. Otherwise, you won't be saved. So despair is a mortal sin. Don't you have sympathy for people that are in despair because it's simply self-pity. It's complete self-focus. And so here we go. Um, uh, These latter crosses of sadness, despair, and unhappiness are to be avoided. They're caused, they're never caused, beloved, by outward things. They're caused by, by our response to outward things. Why are you unhappy? Because such and such happened, or my husband left me, or my my child was killed. It's terrible to say these things so lightly. But these are crosses that don't come from the circumstances, no matter how grave they are. They come from within. They come from within. We are the cause of those crosses. We have lost God. We have lost hope. And Bishop Sheen said, they are made by contradicting the will of God. You see, I haven't read this. I'm reading this along with you. And I'm thinking maybe I'm being harsher than Bishop Sheen, but no, he's saying the same thing. Sadness, despair, and unhappiness are made by contradicting the will of God. How is it that in over three years, we need to leave Tulsa? We've been asked to leave, and yet 25 bishops have said no to us. What's that about? I don't think I ever announced that publicly, but I just did. Well, what's that about? We should be, we should be despairing. We should be losing hope. We're, we're not allowed to even, you know, go forward in Tulsa. What are we going to do? Should we be unhappy? No. And every, no, because that's caused not by outward circumstances, by an inward response, beloved. By an, we have to get out of ourselves and trust God. Well, I don't know how to trust him. Why? It's not that you don't know how. It's that you will not. If someone who you love goes and gives his life for you and dies instead of you, throws you out of the way of the grenade and, and, and takes it and dies, is that a person you're not going to trust? Let's say he didn't die. Let's say he survived his attempt to save your life, and he survived it. And then something happens, and he says, oh, I'll do it for you, and you say, well, I'm not sure I'll trust you. What are you talking about? How can't God be trusted? Go look at the crucifix. There he is for you, for you. He said, well, I know he died for the world. Yes, he died for the world, for you, for every single individual. I think that's what he told Margaret Mary, Saint Margaret Mary. If you were the only one, I would have died for you. His love is beyond anything we understand. There's no pettiness with God. So if we're sad, and I tell you what, I have never um, been sad or despaired or been unhappy when uh, we have uh, a situation in a diocese has not welcomed us. I'm trying to find nice ways to say it. I've not been unhappy because the minute I hear a no or I receive a letter that's a no or whatever it is, I say, Lord, what you don't want, I don't want. There's a tinge of disappointment. There's a little tiny stab. Oh, no. But that's the end of it. Then the second question after, oh, no, the second thought is, you don't want it, God, then I don't want it. And you say, well, some say, I don't say it. Some say, well, what if the bishop, what if God wanted it and the bishop didn't obey him? That's not an issue to me. I can't know those things. But I know that nothing touches me that God doesn't allow, even if he doesn't intend it, even if he doesn't cause it. I should say, he allows it. It's enough for me. I don't care who it's from, devil or flesh or whatever. It doesn't matter to me. If God, if it's touched me, then God has allowed it. It's all I need to know. Why should I be unhappy? I want God's will. It's my food. It's perfect. So I trust. But how long, O oh Lord? That's what the psalmist prayed. Sometimes I join him. How long, O oh Lord? As long as God wants. That's how long it'll be. 
Bishop Sheen says, the vertical bar of the cross stands for God's will. The horizontal bar stands for our wills. When one crosses the other, we have the cross. How do you like that? I love that. When our will crosses God's will, we have the cross, an internal cross, even if external, then we have a cross. But you see, some people say, but you've gone so much and for so long you've gone through so much. You know what? I, I don't know. I don't, I'm a happy camper. I want to be in God's will. And whatever he wants, that's what I want. Well, what if you never find a home? Then that's God's will and we don't find a home. What? I want God's will. I'm a little peanut. Why would I want my God, my will over God's will? How stupid could I be? No. My longing is for God's will. I don't accept God's will. I don't give him permission, as people say. Who am I, little created peanut, to give God permission? I want, I desire, I long for his will. Truly, it's my food. Bishop Sheen said, I law, our, our Lord never promised that we would be without a cross. He only promised that we would never be overcome by one. Oh, aren't these sentences, every one of them gold? Every one of them could be framed as a saying. Our Lord never promised that we would be without a cross. He only promised that we would never be overcome by one. You see? If we are beloved, it's because we've gone into despair and we've said, forget it. I'm going to wallow in my suffering and not trust God and not take the lifesaver. St. Peter so loved the cross that when the time came for his execution, he asked to be crucified upside down. May he, God, who has found guilty, who was found guilty of no other crime than that of the cross of love, make us hate the load of sin that made his cross, the whole cross born in union with his will and following in his footsteps is easier to bear than the splinters against which we rebel. Beloved, I didn't think the day would come where I would second that sentence. But I can tell you with absolute peace and joy and no pain at all that it's true. I'm going to reread it. The whole cross born in union with his. You see? Uh, Jesus said, uh, take up your cross and follow me. My burden is easy. My load is light. And when we are are uh, united with his cross, there's no cross. We don't feel it. We're with him, and he does the walking. We're with him. I, yeah, I heard a little story. I think Tim Staples told it once of a, <clears throat> a father mowing his front lawn with an electric mower, and this son, the little boy son of his, a cute little thing, I don't know, five, six years old, he, he just loved, or maybe he was three. I think he was three. And he loved his dad. He just idolized his dad. So everything his dad did, he wanted to do. So they bought him a little baby lawnmower, a little tiny thing. And so he, when his dad went to mow the lawn, he was walking, and he took his little toy mow mower and was following his dad, but his legs are so tiny, he couldn't keep up with his dad. So they went around. The next time they came around, um, the dad picked up the little boy with his lawnmower and put him on his shoulder and so that way he can keep up with his dad on the lawnmower. It's just so beautiful, you see? And when we come, with, come up with our father, it's because we're on his shoulder. We're in his arms. Otherwise, we could never, ever, ever keep up. So Bishop Sheen says, the whole cross born in union with his will and following in his footsteps is easier to bear than the splinters against we, which we rebel. Isn't that something? Do you know the story of a man one day, he went to Jesus 
And he said, I can't take it. My cross is too large. I'm not that big. It's too big for me. I can't handle it. Lord, I can't. Please give me another cross, please. So uh, please give me a different one. So Jesus said, okay, okay, I will. So he took this man into a room, huge room, size of a big mass merchandiser, big room. And it was just had four walls, nothing else. And the walls were covered with, packed with crosses, all four walls, packed with crosses. And God said to the man, go ahead, pick out the cross you want. And the man said, really? I can pick out any cross I want? And and God said, any cross, any cross. All right, I will. So he went around the room and he's looking for the tiniest cross he could find. And he goes and he looks and he looks and finally he figures out what is the tiniest cross in the room and he said lord he said i could pick out any cross i want right and jesus said right he said could i have that one and jesus said not only can you have that one but that's the cross you gave back to me (laughs) that was his cross all along god knows what we can bear beloved and god knows what we need to grow us up he knows Okay, we just have a few minutes before the break, so we're going to go on to the um, fifth glory, uh, fifth sorrow. I keep saying glorious mysteries because we prayed them yes uh, Sunday, the fifth sorrowful mystery, and that is, of course, our Lord's crucifixion. Our Lord's crucifixion. Just think of that, beloved. Whatever you go through, think. Go to the crucifix. Go to the crucifix, and. Let yourself be absorbed in it and realize that that's not just a picture of our Savior. It's what you did to him. I didn't do it. Oh, yes, you did. Otherwise, he wouldn't be on the cross. I did it. We all did it. He died for the whole world. One man said to me once, well, he didn't do it for me. I mean, I, 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 don't ha- I don't have that sin. I didn't put him on the cross. I said, well, that's fine. You didn't put him on the cross. Your destiny is hell. Because if you didn't put him on the cross, he didn't die for you. And if he didn't die for you, you're going to die in your sins. You see? Okay. The crucifixion of our Lord. Bishop Sheen says, The cross reveals that unless there is a good Friday in our lives, there will never be an Easter Sunday. Unless there is a crown of thorns... There will never be the halo of light. Unless there is the scourged body, there will never be a glorified one. Death to the lower self is the condition of resurrection to the higher self. The world says to us, as it said to him on the cross, come down and we'll believe if you're the son of God. Come down from that cross, we'll believe. But if he had come down... He never would have saved us. It is human to come down. It is divine to hang there. A broken heart, O Savior of the world, is love's best cradle. Smite my own as Moses did the rock, that thy love may enter in. It's beautiful, beloved. It is beautiful. We'll be right back after this break. Call in toll-free or text with anything on your heart, toll free, one 511 5483 We'll be right back. St. Anthony Mary Claret said, Love is the most necessary of all virtues. A great way to show love for your neighbors is by placing a Catholic Radio bumper magnet on your car. This way, no matter where you go, you're providing the opportunity for others to learn about Christ and His Church. We offer free bumper magnets to promote Catholic Radio so others will come to know our Lord through listening. For your free bumper magnets, click the Promote tab at the top of our website, thestationofthecross.com. That's thestationofthecross.com. Then click the Promote tab at the top of our website. Thank you for sharing Catholic Radio wherever your journeys take you. 
Love learning more about the church, but confused or disheartened by the struggles we are facing today? Follow LifeSite News Catholic on Facebook, Twitter, or sign up for LifeSite Catholic emails and stay up to date on the constant stream of news about the Catholic Church. Our church is in a time of crisis, and we as laity have a responsibility and a duty to educate ourselves and stay true to the faith. LifeSite News Catholic is dedicated to keeping the laity informed and educated. To follow us, go to Facebook or Twitter and search LifeSite News Catholic. As Mother Miriam always says, we must live as if it were true. Dominus et Vobis, et cum Tune in weekdays from 6 to 7 a.m. Eastern for Sermons for Everyday Living, a program that brings you real sermons from real priests on topics important to you and your faith. Visit thestationofthecross.com for details. Welcome to Mother Miriam Live on the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network with live video streaming brought to you by LifeSite News and the Station of the Cross. Call Mother with your questions at 1-877-511-5483 or email her at mother at thestationofthecross.com. Welcome back, beloved, to Mother Miriam Live. It's wonderful to be with you, and we have now before us my favorite part of the program, just you and I, um, for a whole half hour to call in or text or email with anything on your heart. doesn't have to be what we're speaking about. The toll-free number to call or text is one 511 5483 or email at mother at thestationofthecross.com. We have an email from Carol, uh, and she writes, I am the mother of three, two vaccine injuries children who, look, I'm not sure what she's, I think she's saying I'm the mother of three, if I'm guessing what she's saying, it's two of which had injuries from uh, vaccines, uh, vaccinations. Um, And these two children will lose the educational placements they so desperately need should mandates become law. I'm not, I'm not quite sure what that sentence is saying, but let me go on. Both kids had post-vaccination developmental regressions. Oh, how awful. We've been warning about this, beloved. This is, this is oh, look at this. Both of her children had post-vaccination developmental regressions. Vaccines devastated the children God sent me. They are no longer how they came to us. Oh, my heart is breaking for this. My son was high risk for trisomy trisomy 21, Down syndrome, or uh, trisomy 18, I'm sure I'm not pronouncing that right, which is incompatible with life. He was high risk for that. Knowing this, my husband and I accepted our son, how he was, regardless of whether he would or would not, whether we would or would not ever hold him. He was born healthy. I love my son, but I mourned the son I had. Now, I'm not sure quite what you're saying here. I did not want to stay alive when I realized what had happened to him, what I had done to him. Oh, she mourns the son that she had, um, I guess because what you did to him through allowing him to have vaccinations, I'm guessing at this. She says, we finally got to a place where both kids are doing well, and now, once again, we are at risk. We could lose our kids to vaccine injury or to DEF, I don't know what that is, if it becomes law and we don't vaccinate. I don't know what DEF is. What would Jesus do? I believe he would flip the tables. Am I wrong? Thank you. No, you can flip the tables, but you need to keep your son alive. You need to keep your children alive. Just make sure you take them out of school and you keep them at home. 
make sure that you homeschool them. Make sure that you do everything within your power by God's grace to stay at home. Everything in your power by God's grace to stay at home. The picture of St. Bernadette just came to my mind. Her father was a miller out of work. They were very poor. And so he went door to door to the baker, to the hospital, just to find odd jobs if they needed a messenger or somebody to the, for the day. And he wound up taking all the, all the um, sin, not sin, but disease-drenched rags to the garbage dump. And all of that. So, uh, or or uh, until until by God's grace he got a miller's job again. What did the mother do? Did she go get a job? Did she go door to door? No, she stayed home where she belonged. She took care of the house. She did people's ironing. She did their washing. She did everything she could do at home. And so, mothers, you need to do that. You need to be creative. You need to stay home and homeschool your children. And if you are grandparents and you can let your your daughter work, your daughter has children, and um, uh, if you can support them financially, do that, family. Support them financially so they can be at home and homeschool their children. And if you can't do that, then go to their home during the day and you homeschool their children so they can go out and earn some money. We need... We need to come together and do this and not submit our people. If it becomes law, um, I don't know what DEF means. Oh, no, it's DCF. I don't even know what that means. Maybe it means vaccinate. Um, Maybe that's a term for vaccination. It doesn't matter. If you don't put your children in school, even Catholic schools, if they require that, then they're not going to get you. They may. They may hunt you down as homeschooling. I don't know. But we have to deal with this as we can. We have to not let ourselves be victims of the government and of an evil, evil system. And I'm, I can't tell you how glad I am for your email, how deeply, deeply sorry and grieved I am, Carol, at the situation you have lived through. It's absolutely, it's, it's worse than a horror movie to me. But thank you for your charity um, and in writing in. Go turn over the tables. Don't put yourself in jail because then you can't raise your children. So, so be wise. Um, but protect your children no matter what it takes. All right? Um, sell your home. Sell whatever it takes. Sell everything you have. Uh, have a roof over your head and have food. That's all you need. Um, you know what? Um, uh, if you have to wind up sleeping on the floor, it's not the worst thing in the world. Uh, you can do that. Get some blankets and you can sleep on the floor if you don't have furniture. Uh, I know I know families that have done that. Um, I won't go into stories. You can do that. Mother Teresa, when she goes into a, a convent or a building that she makes a convent, she throws everything out, including the beds. They may keep the mattresses. I'm not sure. But I've been where Mother Teresa... Uh, her sisters are, and they do have a mattress. I will tell you that, but it's on a bare floor. <clears throat> we have an email from Jennifer, and she writes, Dear Mother Miriam, I have listened to you on the radio and your TV program on EWTN that was filmed many years ago. I have really admired your path that you have taken and your insight. Well, thank you so much, um, Jennifer, but I bless God for every single gift. Uh, the only thing we have, as you know, is what God has given us, and and woe to us if we keep it to ourselves. So I'm, I'm really a happy camper. My daughter Jennifer says, baptized Catholic as an infant, is now 25 and is having d- having deep and serious regret that she did not marry her boyfriend from college that was Jewish. Okay. We stop there. You hear the music. We'll come back to this email right after the break. The toll-free number is 1-877-511-5483. Um, or email at mother at thestationofthecross.com. We'll be right back.
you're new to iCatholic Radio, welcome to the free mobile app of the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network. It's available for download on your Android and Apple mobile devices. If you have any questions about your new app, please contact us at thestationofthecross.com or 1-877-888-6279. That's thestationofthecross.com or 1-877-888-6279. Through your new app, you can listen to podcasts of shows, conference talks, and prayers. View our programming grid, call us directly, and check out our mobile website. You can even learn how you can promote iCatholic Radio in your community. Connect with us through social media and financially support the programming you love. That's all available on your iCatholic Radio mobile app. Thank you for joining our iCatholic Radio family, proclaiming the fullness of truth with clarity and charity. Love learning more about the church, but confused or disheartened by the struggles we are facing today? Follow LifeSite News Catholic on Facebook, Twitter, or sign up for LifeSite Catholic emails and stay up to date on the constant stream of news about the Catholic Church. Our church is in a time of crisis, and we as laity have a responsibility and a duty to educate ourselves and stay true to the faith. LifeSite News Catholic is dedicated to keeping the laity informed and educated. To follow us, go to Facebook or Twitter and search LifeSite News Catholic. As Mother Miriam always says, we must live as if it were true. Dominus et vobis, et dum to Mother Miriam Live on the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network with live video streaming brought to you by LifeSite News and the Station of the Cross. Call Mother with your questions at 1-877-511-5483 or email her at mother at thestationofthecross.com. Welcome back, beloved. Uh, to Mar- Miriam Live. This is the last segment of our program, and we've got over 15 minutes, and uh, you are free at any time. Uh, free. Uh, you're welcome to call in at any time, toll free or text at 1 877 511 5483 or email at mother at the station of the cross dot com. And we started an email from Jennifer. And I just got through the first two sentences, so I'll, I'll begin it again. It, Jennifer says, Dear Mother Miriam, um, okay, I'll, I'll, intro, I'll skip the introduction there. She says, My daughter, who was baptized Catholic as an infant, is now 25 and is having deep and serious regret that she did not marry her boyfriend from college that was Jewish. They were darling together, yet there was a lot of drama although she really wanted to be married and to start a family, and that was their plan. He was Jewish, and for some reason, she was afraid to ask him if they would also celebrate Christmas. She broke up with him three times. I think uh, she was, he was really in love with her and would not accept the breakup, but she was so very torn. She was crazy about him, and yet she did not want to live in New York, as he said his long-term plans were. Well, uh, okay, let, let me go on with this email here. Uh, that, uh, th- those are enough problems already to not, for two people not to get married. Um, and Jennifer says, please help us to reconcile this. She has gone into a deep depression in the last month after hearing that he is engaged in getting married. I'm feeling really bad because I did not support the marriage for my own reason, being that he did not believe that Jesus was the true Messiah, our Savior. Her dad had his own reasons because of her moving to the East Coast. We are on the West Coast. We both feel terribly guilty and wonder if this was the man she was supposed to have married. If you could please, please share your thoughts to help us bring peace to this, I would be so thankful. Um, May God bless you always. Okay. Oh, wow. I'm going to tell you right now, this is not the man she was supposed to marry. 
as painful as it is for everybody, it, 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 it brought to mind my own situation. When I was in high school, I had such a high school, not college at that point, but I had a high school sweetheart. We were really in love, and I did break up with him. And I tell you what, at the moment, I don't know why. I was Jewish then, and so was he. Where There was no understanding of Christ at all. Um, and there was nothing in the way uh, except my stupidity and fear. I, I guess that way. I just don't even remember why I broke up with him. But years later, when I looked back at pictures and I started dating other men, I always regretted. I said, well, what a fool I was to let him go. He was so good and, you know, all of that. And he really, really loved me. I knew that. And so I, I regretted it for years. Again, I was still Jewish. And then I'll tell you, when I uh, gave my life to Christ, I thought back to that gentleman. And now I was in my 30s. So it was um, 10 years later or 15 years later, or whatever it was. Um, and uh, as as much as my heart still deeply appreciated and had an affection for that gentleman, I, I, I breathed a sigh of relief. I said, oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. What if I would have married him and then become a Christian? And he didn't. It would have been an awful, awful situation. So I've always thanked God. I've had three marriage proposals there. I'm allowing, I'm announcing this all over the world. I'm announcing such personal things. I've never been married, but I've had three proposals. And when I came into the Catholic Church, I can't tell you, and I'm one of them from my evangelical years, I cannot tell you, I could I get on the floor and kiss God, that he brought me into his church, that he made me his bride and I I could never have been so happy, no matter what, in my whole life. So now let me tell you what's wrong with this situation. Um, you say that she, they were darling together, but there was a lot of drama. Well, there shouldn't be. Although she really wanted to be married, sort of family, he was Jewish. For some reason, she was afraid to ask him if they could celebrate Christmas. Well, is that what it means to be Catholic, to celebrate Christmas? Absolutely not. What it means to be Catholic is to baptize your children right at their birth, as close to their birth as you can, and to raise them Catholic and to live as a Catholic family, which if you don't live as a Catholic family, you are not raising your children Catholic no matter what you tell them. So afraid to ask him if he would mind celebrating Christmas, what does that have to do with raising your children Catholic? And if he married you in the church, he would have to agree to raise your children Catholic, and there would be a lot of trouble there, an awful lot of trouble there. And I broke up with him three times, um, and she didn't want to live in New York as he, he wanted to. So one, you know, she was unhappy that he wasn't, that he wouldn't maybe celebrate Christmas, that's not being Catholic, and secondly, that she didn't want to live in New York. I tell you, this is a woman that wasn't ready to marry at all, because when you are ready to marry, the two become one, and you don't have separate wills. You don't have separate wills. You will go with your husband. You will be his helpmeet, um, and you will not stay away from marriage because of it. And if you stay away from marriage because of it, your marriage will be absolutely miserable because you'll be selfish the rest of your life. And the parent says, um, uh, let's see now, um, you didn't support the marriage mom because he didn't believe that Jesus was the true Messiah and our Savior. Well, you haven't said yes, so it, that's right, but he could have believed that and still been Protestant, and she still shouldn't have married him. You're right that you didn't encourage the marriage because he wasn't a Christian or a Catholic. You're absolutely right for that, Mom. And as far as Dad had his own reasons about her going to the West Coast, that's just simply human, and that has nothing to do with God's will for your daughter's life. Parents, you need to love God enough. You need to love your children enough to let them go no matter what God's will is for their life, if it's God's will. You need to do that. So many young people want to go into religious life with a priesthood, and the parents stop them. No, I want grandchildren. No, I want you to be a normal person with a, a, a man or marry, if it's a son, marry a woman and have a family. I want grandchildren. Grandparents, stop it. Stop being selfish. 
you had your children. Now love them enough to let them go and let them follow God's will. If not, you're not only making them miserable and they will not be happy, but you are bucking God. You are turning from God. You are giving up your vocation instead of raising them for the kingdom. So it ends by saying, if you would please share your thoughts to help bring peace to this, I would be so thankful. The only thing to help bring peace to this is to give God thanks. The Apostle Paul writes to the Thessalonians, in the midst of awful things, give God thanks in every circumstances, for this is the will of God concerning you in Christ Jesus. Give him thanks. You don't have to understand the situation, but join with your daughter and your husband and pray and say, Lord, we trust that your ways are perfect. We trust that we did not let go something you would have had to happen. We trust it. And because our hearts were so sad, why are they sad? We want our daughter's happiness. This is a good thing, but we don't want her happiness if it's out of your will, beloved Lord. We don't want that. And Father, you could say, yeah, I didn't want her uh, all the way on the East Coast in New York because we're on the West Coast and I would miss her. You can repent for that. You can say, no, I was selfish. I didn't consider what you wanted for her life, Lord, only what I wanted. But I thank you. I thank you that for your reasons, not for ours, you um, uh, had them break up. And now we pray for this young man and your daughter must pray for him. And the same thing with the man that I regretted not being with and eventually not marrying. And he did marry someone else. And I said, blessed be God. That's what his vocation was. Mine was not, but I couldn't understand it. You see, we're all made for love. We're made by love. We're made for love. And we need to love and we need to not be alone. But we don't always know what will fill that. That's why people get into all kinds of uh, promiscuity and drugs and everything else and uh, food, whatever the, the uh, addiction is, because we want, we're not made to be alone. And when we feel that emptiness and loneliness and incompleteness, instead of turning to God, who's the only one that can complete it, St. Augustine said, uh, we're made for God and uh, we have a God-shaped vacuum and he alone can fill that. And when we look for something else to fill it, a wrong, uh, a, a, a sinful love situation, a wrong dating situation, uh, uh, as I said, sex, drugs, everything uh, that's sinful, we're looking to fill it, but it's only going to bring us, indeed, into despair and down to hell unless we come out of it and say, Lord, you're the only one that could fill me. I, I don't understand how that works, but I believe it, and I ask you to take my life and do it, and he will. So parents who wrote in on this one, Jennifer, uh, bless God, give thanks that your daughter did not marry this man. It was not God's will, and she was not ready she, she was not ready, uh, trying to make him what he's not, being willing to celebrate Christmas, her moving to across the country and disappointing her parents. That's not someone who's ready for marriage. Not yet. Uh, um, God calls um, a man and a woman to leave their parents and start their lives together. Okay. So you give thanks to God and draw near to God and get a spiritual director, uh, Jennifer, tell your daughter to get a spiritual director and discern God's will for her and become mature and become confident in who she is in Christ, that no worldly issue uh, like location or other things will ever stand in the way of the God, of the man God would have her to marry. Okay, we have a Another email from somebody who writes it anonymously and says, my husband and I were married in the church and he is a non-Catholic Christian. We had zero formation prior to marriage. Well, there you go. Zero formation prior to marriage. Um, again, if you were married in the Catholic church, the only way you could have been married in the Catholic church <clears throat> is if you agreed to raise your children Catholic and who, whatever priest married you uh, is at fault here. He is absolutely at fault to marry you without uh, formation, without marriage preparation. 
um, Anonymous goes on to say, we have struggled greatly because of this, especially as I grew more in my faith. Absolutely. It's very understandable. He is being supportive of us, raising our son in the Catholic Church. He attends the Latin Mass with us. However, at this time, he does now wish to learn about the Catholic faith and struggles with some of the things I teach my son. Well, this is great that he wants to learn. He wants to participate and read and teach our son about the Bible, although it's great. I am hesitant if he may say something that is not in line with what the Catholic Church teaches. I also do not want our son to listen to contemporary Christian music, and at times my husband plays this music to our son. Our son is only a toddler, but I already do not want him to get mixed messages about his faith. This is a very, very familiar uh, scenario to me. I wonder if you've written in before and I've answered it before, and you're you're coming again. I don't know that. Um, if you agreed to raise your son Catholic, then just say, sweetheart, you agreed to raise our son Catholic. Let's do the Bible study together. And if there's most of it, won't be a problem. But if there is a problem, if anything is is not the the understanding, the teaching of the Catholic Church as the interpretation of Scripture. Uh, I'll come in, you know, and and I'll um, I'll I'll support what you're saying, and then say if it's right, and then just say and and what else the church teaches is this, you see. So um, um, and the only thing you really have to come out and contradict is if if he says any of the sacraments are symbolic, then you come in and say yes, sweetheart. Um, and they're wonderful symbols. And the special thing about our faith is that God does through the symbol what the symbols symbolize. And you can't say that to a two-year-old, but you can begin to break it down and explain it to him. We can't finish your email, uh, but we will open with it tomorrow. Yours will be the first email we will take tomorrow. God bless all of you. Live the faith with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. Um, love your neighbors yourself. And whoever you're dating, love him enough to give up everything you want if it's in union with God's will. And if it's not, and you love him more than God, you're going to be in trouble. Your marriage will not work, and you will be blind if you get married at that stage. A Catholic should marry a Catholic. I know, but yes, you should. We'll speak with you tomorrow.